Welcome to St. Mark's Worship once again. We're getting a little better at this each week. Uh, last week we were on the traditional side. This week we're going to do it here on the contemporary side. Uh, there are a few things that I would share with you before we get started. First of all, uh, we have closed the church offices. And, uh, but we're still checking the emails, checking the phones, and uh, we have a weekly email that goes out every Tuesday afternoon. If you didn't get that on Tuesday, would you call the church office and leave a message, let us know, and we will make sure that you get on that. Uh, also, I want to share with you, uh, while I know that St. Mark's folks are doing their best to give and remember, you can do that on the website. Uh, if you're watching us and this is not your home church, would you please make sure that you give to your home church? Uh, your pastor is uh, doing his best to hold your church together, and that's part of what it takes to make that work. So uh, thank you for watching anyway. The last thing I would share with you is that every year St. Mark's buys flowers from Brookwood Community in Brookshire. And uh, this year with all the crisis going on, much of their sales is down they are a community that gives education and uh, work for disabled adults. And they were worried, they asked, are, are we still going to buy flowers from them? We said, of course we would. And we made a commitment to buy 75 of those, uh, those flowers. I think they're hydrangeas and calla lilies, whatever those are. Some of you know that. Um, but if you've signed up to do that, please, uh, please do that. You can get that information on our website as well. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day, and we worship you wherever we are, however we, uh, we gather. We honor you. Amen. Oh, it's so 
This week, I want to share with you uh, about the spiritual discipline of confession. We've, uh, we've worked through several of the spiritual disciplines. Confession is the one that everyone shrinks back from. And I want to tell you how I uh, approach this. I remember when I was little, maybe four or five, I remember getting in trouble with my mom, and this isn't characteristic, she didn't do this uh, later on in our lives, but I remember her sending me to my bedroom until my dad got home from work, and I remember her telling me that I need to ponder what I was going to say to my dad when I got home. She was telling me I needed to be honest about what I did, and she was going to let me tell my dad. And so I sat there in my bedroom all afternoon. It was probably 30 minutes, but I remember it being all day. Wondering what I was going to say and how I was going to put words to what I did and how honest was I going to be. I mean, a a four or five-year-old can have these thoughts. I remember this. Uh, I don't think my mom would remember this at all. But uh, I will tell you this week, as we have all hunkered down and been told, go to your home, don't move, don't come out, stay there till we tell you it's safe to come back again, I felt like that's where I am. I'm pondering all the things that I've done that put me in this place, and how honest do I need to be with myself? As we approach the spiritual discipline of confession, I will share with you, your faith isn't complete if you haven't worked confession into your life. And I want to talk about how we do that. Uh, First of all, in Matthew, chapter 12, verse 34 and following there, Jesus says that there is a connection between what our mouth says and what our heart does. He says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you the truth, he says, men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned." There is a connection between what the mouth says and what the heart actually experiences. Uh, That's important. When I was dating in college, uh, I had a friend whose wife kicked him out of their house. And uh, he came and stayed with me for about three months. I was dating somebody at that time, and he was wrestling with getting his life in order. And I got crossways with my girlfriend. And I remember deciding hmm, maybe I'm not, maybe we ought to break up. And uh, my buddy was laying on the couch as he listened to me on the phone, and he said, uh, take her flowers. And I said, are you kidding me? I'm not even sure I want to be with her. Why would I take her flowers? He said, trust me, just go buy flowers and take them to her, drop them off, and come back. I had a lot of respect for him. We had joined the army together. We had gone through quite a bit growing up. And uh, I said, all right, all right, I'll I'll do this. And I went to Kroger and I got the cheapest bouquet I could get because I was in college and, you know, that's what you do. Um, About two days later, I was telling him, yeah, she didn't really respond. He said, that's okay. It's not about her response. He said, do you want to date her? I said, I don't know. He said, well, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Go buy her flowers again. I'm like, dude, I don't have unlimited money for this. He said, just just do it. And so I did. I bought her flowers. We never did stay together long term. But I will tell you, something about buying flowers for a girl changed my heart. The things that I was angry about, those things that were driving me, uh, they were no longer a part of this. I've been buying her flowers. I, it, it changed the way I felt. It turns out that we don't fall in love because we have all these wonderful feelings. We have wonderful feelings because we have decided that we will love. 
There's a connection between what the mouth says, what we act on, and what our heart really feels. And that's what confession is about. I remember one of my early DSs, uh, supervisors in ministry, Jack Albright. He stood up in front of us one time and he said, my wife hears my confession. And that was profound. Uh, Part of that is, I was married at the time and I'm not sure I could confess to my wife. Now it's not like I was running around doing anything that was deep uh, and troublesome, but the reality is I hadn't been in the habit of sharing the deepest fears and anxieties that I have with the one that I had chosen to be with in my life. And I had to learn that confession means opening that part of myself so somebody else can see in and letting the light shine into the darkness. The the reality is there is power in confessing our sins. Um, Can I become the person I really want to be if I leave that stuff buried in there? There are things that I don't want anybody to see things that I'm ashamed of, things that I know aren't right, where I've cut corners. And as long as I keep them hidden, they are a part of me. But if I can find a way to bring those out and say them out loud, self-honesty heals. And self-honesty brings reconciliation before God. Because at the end of the day, it's not about how I feel or even how my wife hears my confession. It's more about me being honest before God. If we can see ourselves fully and truthfully and honestly for all of our flaws, we begin to see God for who He is. And we understand forgiveness for what it truly is. And none of that can happen if we can't be honest with ourselves. And confession is the spiritual discipline, and it's not a practice. It's not like going to worship. It's a discipline. It takes hard work to be that self-honest and look in the mirror and acknowledge our shortcomings. But there's something happens uh, when we do that. In John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I think I've beaten that horse enough. I think in theory we all probably uh, can agree that there's probably some value in in confessing our sins. Uh, I had uh, early on had somebody tell me, said uh, you should be able to to tell your wife everything. Well, that doesn't mean you should tell her everything. That's, you know, you should be able to tell her anything. But there are things that I haven't told my wife because it would hurt her. So it means that I have to have someone else as a confessor. Someone else to hear that struggle within me. Because while She doesn't have the need to hear all of my anger issues with people I encounter in my work. I do have the need to say it out loud so that I can be honest with God and honest with myself. The reality is we believe in confession in theory. I'm going to assume that we can all agree with that. Um, But the system breaks down in how we actually practice it. Most of the time, we in the Protestant church, we do good lip service to confession. But how many of us really bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed? We say the words, but there's more to confession than praying this prayer. Here's where the system breaks down. I, uh, I have heard these statements and I even wrote them down. Um, Here are some practical objections to actually confessing. Um, Well, I don't believe in airing my laundry list. That's not good. You keep that stuff in-house. Okay, that's nice. It's an excuse for not confessing. Um, How about this one? I hear this a lot. 
I'm not Catholic. I can't go for sitting in that box and stuff. Or, I've heard this one. I am Catholic, and I can't go for sitting in that box and stuff. There's a certain amount of that that we've institutionalized, and I think in doing so, you have to be trained to use it right. There's a real value in what our sisters and brothers in the Catholic Church do in confession. And because we've said, oh, no, no, we don't need to confess to somebody, uh, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. We have gone to the place where we give lip service to confessing our sins, but we, we don't really know how to do it. Um, how about this one? I ask forgiveness in my own way. I don't need to list them all. You have no problem listing their sin. You know, if you're married, you know all the sins of your spouse. I'll bet you do. The, uh, the problem is we don't want to list our own. If I go and confess to someone and they remind me that I am forgiven, they're not forgiving me. If you come to me and confess your sin, say, Pastor, this is what's going on in my life, and I've got to say it out loud, I could remind you that your sins have been forgiven by Christ. That doesn't mean I'm forgiving you. It's not my power that does it. It's the power of Christ that does it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, uh, a priest during Nazi Germany, and until he was killed by the Nazis, he led an underground seminary and trained pastors in the shadow of Nazi Germany. He said this, Our brother has been given to help us. He hears the confession of our sin in Christ's stead, and he forgives our sin in Christ's name. He keeps the secret of our confession as God keeps it. When I go to my brother to confess, I am going to God. That's powerful. Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran. He understood the need to confess our sins. A few years ago, uh, when I was in graduate school, I got the opportunity to go as a cohort to California and we visited Rick Warren's church, uh, Purpose Driven Life book. We, uh, we visited Robert Schuller and the Crystal Cathedral. We visited about 15 churches together as a way to get our, our group together. We were 14 married men and one single woman. We, uh, and we needed to build community. One of the things that happened there, we were walking down... Uh, uh, Hollywood Boulevard, uh, beautiful day, because it always is in California. We, uh, we were walking along, and we were getting to know each other. Uh, it was hard for that one single young lady to be a part of this. She was 10 years younger than the rest of us. She was single, uh, but she was part of us, and she was going to be with us for the whole year of study that we were in together. And uh, so I made it my job to make sure that she didn't feel left out. Uh, at some point in the conversation, we're walking along, and I reached out and I touched her elbow. You know, like you do when you're palling around with folks, well, not in this pandemic period, but you remember back in the day when you could actually be near somebody. And I touched her on the elbow and uh, got her attention and said something. Um, a shock went through me. I don't think it mattered to her. I don't think she ever noticed. But I felt like I had crossed uh, a boundary. I had uh, been married for 10 years at this point. I had little kids. I don't know that I had ever been around an attractive female besides my wife close enough to touch them on the elbow in the midst of a conversation. And when I did it, I immediately felt like there was a boundary that had been crossed. Um, and we're all walking down the street. It wasn't any big deal. They were laughing and joking and telling jokes. Um, I fell out of the group and just dropped back about 20 feet and pulled my phone out, and I called my best friend. And uh, we have built this relationship between us. And I called him and I said, John, I think I, um, I violated a boundary, and I just need to say it out loud. And he listened to me. He heard my story. And he said, uh, Ken, did you mean to do something wrong? I said, no. He said, 
are you going to do it again? And I said, no. He said, um, go and sin no more. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I flooded with just relief. Not that I didn't know these things. He wasn't forgiving me. He was reminding me that the blood of Christ's sacrifice covered my sin. That my confessing it allowed me to experience it. And it wasn't a couple of months later that he called me in a moment of crisis in his own life to confess something that uh, he really didn't know how to say. And I said, are you going to do it again? No. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. These are things that we needed to say out loud. It was not going to bless my wife to say, oh, I think I violated some boundary in our marriage. That was not going to bother her. She's heard this before, though, uh, since then. But the reality is there are things that she doesn't necessarily need to hear, but there are things I need to say. So I have made it a commitment in my Christian life to surround me with other godly men that can hear my confession the way Bonhoeffer talked about it. And it's because we need that. The Roman Catholic Church for many, many years has instituted that, but that's because they recognize the value of this as a spiritual discipline. And so they have created an, a, a situation where if you know you need this and if you treat it the way it should be treated, they have an opportunity. And because we don't do that, because we don't want to be Roman Catholic, sometimes we have lost that ability to hear each other's confession. Um, so there are some practical things that I would share with you. Here are three things that we need to do. First of all, we need to speak it out loud. We need, to, we need to hear ourselves say it. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's the way our sin becomes real to us. That's the first thing we need to do. We need to speak it out loud. Number two, we need to speak it out loud to flesh and blood human beings. It's not enough to kneel down and pray my confession to God. There are some things that don't anchor in my spirit if I don't say it out loud. Not just so that I can hear somebody say I'm forgiven, but so that I say it out loud and it becomes a real thing. And so I can begin to deal with who I really am. It's self-honesty to say it out loud. In James chapter 5, verse 16, he says, therefore confess your sin to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. There is something incarnational about saying your sin out loud to someone. And that someone may be a friend, it may be a spouse, it may be a stranger, it may be a pastor. Maybe somebody on the other side of that screen while you're sitting in that box, but suddenly the box is not the issue. To say it out loud, the person on the other side who hears our confession is essentially incarnating Christ for us so that we can be told in no uncertain terms that yes, even this sin can be covered by the blood of Christ if we give it to him. That's an amazing thing about confession. There's a third thing. We need to speak it out loud to somebody who is flesh and blood. But it also has to be someone who can speak the words of Christ back to me. In John chapter 20, verse 23 Jesus said, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That wasn't license to not forgive someone. He was saying there's something that happens when we hear a confession and we remind them, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the formal Holy Communion liturgy, that's my favorite part. 
where I tell the congregation, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and then I get to stand there and you repeat it back to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, you, Ken, are forgiven. And then together we say, glory to God. Amen. Because there is healing in those words. Even if they're ritualized, they carry that meaning. And when you're aware of it, they carry that meaning for you every time you hear those words spoken. Now, having confessed our sin is part of it. Um, But there are two halves to confession. And this last piece, I want you to get. Confessing the bad stuff is great, but what do you do then? Um, There is power in confessing Christ. Um, In Matthew 12, 43, Jesus says this. This is interesting. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through the arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the final condition of the man is worse than the first. Anybody who has been through some level of the 12-step program will tell you there is power in confessing your sins, in speaking them aloud, but if we don't replace them with a profession then all we've done is cleaned the house and made it habitable again for all that stuff to come back. And how many of us have struggled with our own sin coming back and coming back and coming back. And what Jesus is saying here is that there is power in cleaning out the house, confessing our sin, but then we need to turn around and in that place, in that cleaned out house, we need to place a profession of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember at the very beginning of this, I said there's connection between what our mouth says and what our heart experiences. And so we must confess our Lord Jesus Christ and put that into that place. And then we need to live there. Um, I have known so many people who had cleaned out their house but weren't yet ready to profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's a struggle because that amounts to arrested spiritual development. It amounts to um, living in a kind of limbo where we've cleaned the house and we've done our best to stay away from all the bad stuff. But we've not ever finished, closed the deal. We've not ever gotten to a place where we said, Lord, I can't do this anymore on my own power. And I'm going to trust you. And this God thing doesn't make sense. And this Jesus stuff doesn't make sense. But I know what I've had. And I know what I've got. And I'm going to take a leap of faith. And I'm going to trust in you. That's what professing means. It means closing the the deal on that. It means finishing the event. Romans 10, 9 If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess it and are saved. Jesus asked that question of Peter. He said, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by God, by man, but by my Father in heaven. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we open our hearts to you. We ask that you would give us the strength to look at ourselves honestly. And in that light shed by Christ on the cross, we trust you that you will make us whole. Amen.
in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Oh, you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song. Oh, of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Oh, and I'm no longer. chosen me Oh love has called my name When I've been born again into your family Oh your blood flows through my veins Oh and I'm no longer Cause I am a child of God Oh, and I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God child of God. Oh, I am a child of God. Oh, I am a child of God. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, and I'm no longer a slave to fear because I child of God Oh, and I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, no Because I am
I'm a child 